Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Celso Batalha. So I'm going to go over the series of problems on pressure. The first one I have here, hydraulic jack has an input piston of an area given. So it's right here, area is given, and, and w which is this area here, right there. And the output area is this one here. Oops, it's this one right there, OK? which is 0 0.7 uh, 70 cubic meters. The first thing you, you have to do when you complete these problems is to realize and to ensure you have consistent uh, unities. So here you have a, uh, I'm sorry, so I don't have consistent unities. Um, sorry, they should be two, two, there you go. Okay, so we have an area of 0.05 square meters and then an output area 0.07 uh, square meters. So exactly what you're going to do, you're going to exert some force right here. So you're going to step off your foot there or whatever. And, and assume this is in the same level, right? Assume this is in the same level. According to... Um, to Pascal principle, if you have a liquid that or a fluid that is completely uh, enclosed, uh, the pressure of this leak at this level is the same as it is there, right? So, for instance, if you take a point right here, the pressure at this point is also equal to the pressure at that point, and is equal to the pressure at any given point in this horizontal, right? And uh, so, if the pressure Let's call this point one. If pressure in point one is equal pressure at point two, better say output PO. If P1 is equal to PO, right? Then uh, what is the definition of pressure? Well, pressure is the force that is being exerted on a given cross-sectional area. And what is PO, output area? is the force that will be exerted on the other cross-sectional area, right? Now look at this. F1 is the force of your foot, and FO is the force of the car itself. It's the weight of the car, assuming this cylinder here has no, no weight, right? No significant weight compared with the weight of the car itself. Okay. So if the two pressures are the same, we have a simple math problem. F1 over A1 is equal F2 over A2. FO over AO. And therefore, uh, F1 is equal F0, A1 over A0. So F1, which is the force required to exert, is equal F0, which is the weight of the car, 1.210 to the 4. No, 10, 10 to the third. Man, I'm getting all these numbers wrong. 10 to the third. That multiply A1.05. Divided by a you know, 0.7. Okay, and then you can figure that out. So the main point you're going to find is uh, the force required to uh, the force required to lift a car is much less than the weight of the car, as we can see right here, right? Anyways. The second problem, number two, you have a 66 kilograms man. So this is the man, sorry by my drawing. So this is a nail bed. It's a bed full of nails. I, I'm pretty sure you have seen those before. Probably not, I don't know. And you have some dude that's, you know, take the time to take a nap, you know, and just lay down the nails. So, um, and there are how many nails? 1,208 nails. Isn't that fantastic? The end of each nail, so if you draw a little nail like this, there's a nail right there, 
that's a nail yeah so the tip of the nail right here has an area given right the area is 1 times 10 to minus 6 square meters that's the area given and there are 1280 nails and the man has this much mass here's the question what's the average pressure exerted by one nail on the man's body so this problem here you have to assume let's assume that the weight of this dude the entire weight of this dude is so what is the weight of this dude? It's 66 kilograms mass times 9.8 meters per square second, right? So let me take this nail, all this nail. Oops, what happened? Sorry. Uh, let me take that out. Go back to my pen. There you go. Square sec. So. Um, here's the weight of this guy. So if the guy is nicely uniformly, remember the word uniform is kind of a equally distributed over something. So if the weight of this guy is uniformly distributed over all the nails, so each nail is 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 supporting equal load, right? So therefore, the weight that one single nail is supporting is equal to what? So the weight of one nail, the weight of one nail is equal to 66 times 9.8 divided by the number of nails, right? Does that make sense? So this is the weight of one nail. So the weight that two nails support is two times this number. The nail, two times this number. So the, 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 the weight of the entire uh, nail bed is 1208 times this number. Okay, cool. And we want to find what average pressure is exerted on one single nail. Well, and you use your definition of pressure. What that is, is the weight that each single nail is supporting. And then you just repeat this number. Divided by, divided by the area of one single nail. So uh, I'm, what I'm doing here is to use the definition of what pressure is, force per unit of our area. And then the problem is basically done. Problem number three. What is the mass of a solid gold rectangular bar that has diameters, dimensions given. Um, so we have something like this. Pa, 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 pa. So, so this is, so you have a dimension of 4.5 centimeters you have another dimension of let's say 11 centimeters and you have the depth the depth which is uh, oops I think my scales are all crazy um, better, better make this to be 26 centimeters and the depth the thickness of this gold is 4.5 okay cool so we have the dimensions of our gold, right? And uh, we want to find the mass of it. So which definition we use? So remember the definition of density. The density of anything is equal to the mass of that thing divided by the volume it's occupied. You have to be able to catch that. So the density of gold is given. Uh, in fact, it's not given in the problem, but you go in your book and there is a table with the density of relevant relevant metals and gas so this is given so rho of gold is given i i'm not gonna go find the, the page now but it's something given this is you know that so the density of gold is equal mass of gold divided by the volume of gold the problem is what is the volume of gold well the volume of gold is not given but it is something you can calculate right how can you calculate well because uh, rectangular uh, bar 
So this bar has an area of base. So if you take the area of the base is 26 centimeters times 11 centimeters. That's the area of the base times the thickness of this gold, the height, 4.5 centimeters. So this is the volume. You have to know these formulas of volume. In case you don't remember, you can always ask me um, during exam. And you so to use all of that, and perhaps the density of gold is given as kilograms per cubic meter. Again, be attentive to your units. You have centimeters in there, so you have to convert that to meters. So you are going to multiply 26 times 10 to minus 2 meters times 11 times 10 to minus 2 meters times 4.5 10 to minus 2 meters. So you're going to have something here, cubic meter. Okay. So once you calculate the volume, just plug it in here. Since you know this quantity, just cross multiply those two and you find your mass. Good enough? Problem number four. This is problem number four. I already kind of got the, 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 the densities here. But the problem number four is it says a lead bullet is placed in a pool of mercury. What fractional part of the volume of the bullet is submerged? So there are a few concepts here you have to uh, pay attention to. Um, and, oh God, oh God, what, what is going on here? Um, the first one, I oops, I don't know what's going on here. Um, I'm, I'm just moving the chair, I swear. You know, things get so crazy here. This new technology I'm not using, use it to. But anyway, so, um, take this color, I like this color. There you go. Um, what is the co concept here? Is, um, Archimedes, principle of Archimedes and buoyant force. I mean, what's the definition of a buoyant force? You put any object, you put an object inside a fluid, right? There you go. It's right there. Boop. So <coughs> there will be a floating force called buoyant, buoyant force. So the buoyant force is defined as the mass of the liquid displaced. Because when, when, when you put this mass inside the liquid, um, since not two objects can occupy the same space, um, this mass, this object, kind of displaces the water, right? So you have to figure if it, if it is water, if the liquid is water. So the buoyant force is given by the weight of the liquid that has been displaced by the immersion of whatever object you have there. So in this case, uh, what is the buoyant force? It's simple. You have to figure out the weight of the liquid displaced. So weight, you've got to have your 9.8 there. Now, what is the weight of liquid displaced? Well, no problem. It's the mass of liquid displaced, right? But how do we figure the mass? So this chapter teaches you what that is. The mass of a liquid displaced is equal to the density of that liquid times the volume that has been displaced. So here's the mass times 9.8. So buoyant force is this. We did this exercise in the last lab. So you, sh you should refresh your memory on that. So in this problem, we have something immersed in mercury, correct? So when you find the mass of mercury displaced, you have to punch the density of mercury. You have to punch the volume of mercury that has been displaced in order to figure out the mass of mercury displaced. Okay. So in, in my example here, my simple scratch example, I'm submerging the entire object, right? What if you have something different? You have your you have your container with a liquid and 
your object is partially submerged it's not entirely submerged it's just a piece of it so when you face this type of problems and, and problem number four is one of those types of problems you have to stop you have to stop and think okay good gracious what is being submerged I mean I don't have the entire object submerged I have just a fraction of it right so the buoyant force in this case is going to be given the same mantra M of liquid displaced or, 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 or whatever that has been displaced times 9.8 the question is that now the mass of liquid displaced is the density of your liquid times the volume of the metal of the object that is submerged times 9.8 so you don't use pay attention you don't use the entire volume right you use only the volume that has been submerged because the other part is not this up, upper part here is not submerged okay so this brings us to um, this current problem the one that we are doing now so this problem you have a bullet a lead a bullet that is made of lead that is submerged in the pool of mercury right so so let's do that so here's your pool of mercury and then you that's it so what is submerged this so what are the forces what are the forces acting what are the forces acting on this object here well we always have gravity right we always have gravity we always have the weight of this object which is given by the mass the mass of what the mass of lead times 9.8 right so and by lead I mean by the total thing this is the weight of the total thing right but if this this uh, bullet is in equilibrium this weight is counterbalanced by an upward force buoyant force and that is equal to the mass of liquid mercury liquid displaced times 9.8 or let me bring my bullet here or or density of mercury times volume that has been displaced is V naught is only this part here only this part that is being displaced times 9.8 according to Newton's law if this system is in equilibrium then B is equal to the weight is equal to F G therefore rho of mercury which is the liquid displaced times the volume V naught that has been displaced times 9.8 must be equal to mass of lead mass of lead times 9.8 but what is the mass of lead don't forget is the density of lead times the volume of the entire the entire bullet is the whole thing now let's call V total V total times 9.8 so we want this quantity to be equal to this quantity right so when we make those two quantities equal to each other we can rearrange the equation so that V naught over V total is equal to V total over wait a second V naught over V total is equal to 
rho of lead divided by rho of mercury. So here is the fractional how much of the uh, volume is being submerged. And that is equal to, and then you just plug the numbers. Uh, 1, 1, 3, 4, 2, divided by 1, 3, 5, 9, 5, and you're going to get something here. Okay? So, problem number 5. What is the pressure at the bottom of Loch Ness, which is as much as 754 feet deep? Okay? And the pressure at the top of the lake is given. This is a simple problem in which pressure on a point is related to a pressure in another point in such a way that PA is equal PB plus rho G8. It's one of the uh, basic equations in this chapter. So we want to find PA. So PA is going to be equal to 1.13 times 10 to the 5 Pascal plus the density of water times G times H. Now H here is given in feet. Please convert this to meters and plug it in there. Problem done. Problem number six, we have a wooden uh, block, right here, wooden block, that floats uh, in water and a solid steel object right here is attached to the bottom of the block by a string as in the figure. If the block remains floating, which of the following statements is valid? So then you have several statements. Before we start doing anything, let let me do an FBD. Why not do an FBD on these forces, on this object here? So let's do an FBD on the block itself. Like take this block out, right? And then and then we ask which forces are acting there. So um, Earth pulls this block down, unavoidable, and and that is equal to the mass of this block, whatever that is, times g, 9.8. Okay, good. What else? Well, this block also has a tension. It's called T. And by the way, the size of my vectors are not in scale at all, right? I'm not being careful here. So this is tension. So I have a tension force in there. But also the block, since the block is submerged, it means there is a buoyant force here. There is a buoyant force. Since the system is in equilibrium, you have to have for sure mg must be equal to the buoyant force plus the tension. Okay. So this is a true statement for the block itself that happened to be immersed in the water. Now, if we now bring the wooden block into perspective, Right, take the wooden block there, and then let's do the same nonsense. Which forces are acting on this wooden block? Okay, cool. I do have gravity force, the weight of the block. So Earth is pulling it down, and the weight of block is equal to the mass of this block, whatever that is, times 9.8. Okay, cool. What else? Well, see. I have a fraction of the block that is submerged. It's right there. So which means the block is being held upward with aid of a buoyant force, buoyant force, that is equal to the uh, rho of the liquid displaced. I don't know it's liquid, it's water, right? Times um, uh, the volume submerged and I don't know which volume it is. You have to take that fraction or calculate. But volume submerged times 9.8. Okay, I got my buoyant force. 
rho of the liquid is submerged and volume of that block that has been submerged. But those are not the only two forces. You also have the tension. So this tension force, I'm, ca I'm calling T prime just because I'm a picky one. So this T prime is not the same as this tension here, but it has the same value, the same magnitude. So is the reaction to this tension. Sometimes students go there and call the same force, but it's not. They are different. But the size is the same. So I'm just erasing the prime just to um, let you guys, you guys know the tension, the value, the magnitude is the same, but the vectors are different. So those are the three forces acting on this dude right, right here. Okay, let's see. Uh, what are the options given? The tension in the string is equal to the weight of the steel object. So clearly, this is not the case, right? Because the tension is equal to the weight of the steel object minus the buoyant force on it. Second option, the tension in the string is less than the weight of the steel object. Uh, that is true, because see, tension is equal to the weight of the steel object minus the buoyant force. So this is a true statement. So the second option is good. Uh, third option, the buoyant force on the block is equal to its weight. Uh, that's not a true statement because the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the block plus the tension that is pulling down. Uh, so that's not true. The, ne the next one is the buoyant force on the block is equal to the weight of the volume of water it displays. Yeah, that's correct. That's the definition of a buoyant force. Yeah. And displaces only this volume here. Okay, so this is a true uh, answer as well. The last one, the buoyant force on the steel object is equal to its weight. No, no, the buoyant force is equal to the weight minus the tension. Problem number seven, you have a beach ball that somebody pushes it down. So we have a hand here. We have a little hand that pushes down. Mm, I don't know how to do that. So let's say you, you exert a force down on the ball and then it keeps inside the water, right? And this is a swimming pool. So you, you can kind of uh, think about it. And then what you do next, you take this force out. Oop, it's not there anymore. So what's going to happen? So the moment you take the, uh, the force out of consideration, what's going to happen? The beach ball is going to go up. Okay. So this is the direction of motion here. So right the moment you let the ball go, let me outline right here the forces that are being acting on the ball itself. Which forces are there? So, well, the ball has a mass, which means it has, it has a given weight. So the weight of the beach ball is equal to its mass times 9.8, right? Good. Meters per square second, but we have the weight. Also, the ball is immersed in the water, and there is a buoyant force. There is a buoyant force that is equal to the weight of displaced liquid, which means density of water, pool water with some um, salts and things like that, times the volume of the ball, the volume of the ball, because the ball technically is entirely submerged, so you use the volume of the object you're studying that happens to be submerged times 9.8. So based on our experience, if you have done that before, you know uh, this buoyant force is much larger effect. Buoyant force is much larger than the weight. Yeah. In fact, to be more precise. And what happened is this ball is going to kaboom move up with some acceleration. 
So if you were to do a problem, trying to calculate what is the acceleration of the ball as it go up, no problem. You just take your rho of water, which is your buoyant force, times the volume of the ball, times 9.8, minus mass of the ball, this is a minus, times 9.8 is equal mass of the ball times acceleration. This is Newton's second law applied to this moving ball. So the buoyant force minus the weight of the ball is equal <coughs> mass times acceleration, sum of forces in that y direction is equal mass of the ball, ball times acceleration. And, and then you would solve the problem. I, I'm just going an extra mile here for you. Okay, so what are the options we have here? Uh, option number one, this buoyant force on the ball while it is submerged is equal to the weight of the volume of water the ball displays. This is correct. That's the definition of a buoyant force. Number two, when the ball is released, when the ball is released, the buoyant force exert. Yeah, it, it does, right? It, it so does that the ball goes up with an acceleration. The ball accelerates upward. That's good. As the ball rises in the pool, the buoyant force on it increases. Not This is not true, right? This is not true. Because, see, the buoyant force depends on the density of water, which is fixed. The volume of the ball, supposedly the volume remains the same, right? And 9.8 is a number. Okay, no problem. So this is not right. The other option is the buoyant force on the ball decreases as the ball... No, we just saw that. No, no, we didn't. As the ball rises, the buoyant force on it increases. No, the buoyant force on the ball decreases. No, the buoyant force on the ball equals the weight. No, 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 it doesn't happen. Uh, if it's a beach ball, it doesn't happen, right? You might find a ball of certain material that is just right to keep it submerged without going up or down, but not in in general in a general case, okay? Question number eight, uh, you have three vessels, I'm not going to draw this, so just read the problem. Um, so we have three vessels, they have different shapes, right? And then the first option is three vessels of different shapes are filled to the same level with water as in the figure, figure below. The area of the base is the same for all three vessels, okay? Alright, the pressure at the top First answer, the pressure at the top surface of vessel A is greater because it has the largest surface area. So that's not true. If the three vessels are open to the atmosphere, the pressure on the very top is the same. So the pressure is the same, which is the atmospheric pressure, 1.0 or so, um, 10 to the fifth Pascal. Second uh, option, the pressure at the bottom of vessel A is greatest because it contains the most water. It is true it contains the most water, but uh, if you take this uh, ve vessel over here, this is the pressure at point A, this is the atmospheric pressure. So when you calculate the pressure here, right, we use that expression, PA is equal P at the top in the vertical position plus rho G8. So it depends, it does not depend on the shape. You could, this is true for this vessel, this is true for the vessel number C or letter C, and it's also true for the vessel uh, B, right? Doesn't matter. The pressure at this point O is, is um, o, o P at the bottom is going to be the pressure at this point here which is atmospheric pressure plus rho g8. So the gauge pressure, gauge pressure, which is Pa minus Po, Po is rho g8. Does not depend on the shape, depends only on the vertical, vertical uh, displacement. And that's it.